Guys, kill it! It's the most wonderful time of the year. Now the reason why it's the most wonderful time of the year is because it is Buffer Festival once again, but this time it is warmer than usual. So today is the first day of Buffer Festival. It's actually industry day today. So my first Buffer that I went to two years ago, I was more on the creator side. Now I've kind of gone into the business side and today I'm actually speaking on a panel where it's a creator panel for industry day. It's like kind of two worlds. Am I making sense? Maybe not. Anyways, uh, I'm gonna go speak about how brands can work with creators better. Um, I'm gonna be sitting on a panel with a few, I'm not gonna tell you who, but there's a couple of my favorites on that panel. Um, and rather than me rambling, I might as well just take you along the ride. Let's go. All right, so the place I am going to do the talk is called the Glenn Gould Studio. There it is, the Glenn Gould Studio. Let's go inside. That's what I'm doing Are here. You? Yes. Give me special attention as a mic holder. Half an hour? How am I going to talk for half an hour? Please join me in welcoming Gunnarola, uh, Dodie, Sarah, and Rachel. Come on out, guys. Quickly introduce myself. My name is Andrew Gennady, also known as Gunnarola. Hi, I'm Gunnarola, a music and video producer who travels the world to show you places, people, and stories made in the moment. I work with brands in two different capacities. As a presenter, I host different travel and food series. I've worked with brands such as Tastemade, Cirque du Soleil, Samsung, and Hard Rock Cafe. And as a media company, I produce content that lives on my channels. Um, my name is Dodie. I am a musician, but I also have a channel where I do typical YouTube stuff. This is a bit silly, <laughs> but it's my birthday! Woo! Hello? Hello, congratulations. On what? You got three weeks to million. Um, I'm also a writer of all kinds of different things. Um, I've worked with a lot of brands for video content like Kellogg's and Barclays and, um, I don't know, <laughs> a few, <laughs> a lot. Um, but I think I'm going to be talking more about the sort of like different industries that I've been working with recently because I haven't done a brand deal in a while. My name is Sarah Dici, rhymes with peachy. I am a YouTuber in New York City. Hello! Oh my gosh, is this just a vlog? Is this just a normal old vlog? I think it is. Let's do a plant check. How are you looking? Haven't killed this one yet. I have been a full-time YouTuber for about a year and a half now, so I feel like I am still new. I've gotten the opportunity to work with a lot of tech companies, so a lot of my content is focused on tech and creativity, so working with um, you know, brands from Best Buy to my obsession with sparkling no sugar water, um, so working with like seltzer water companies too, so um, yeah. Hi, my name is Rachel David, and I am from Toronto. Um, I have a little bit of a different story. I'm actually, I was in television for about 10 years, and then I switched over to YouTube. I basically took a year and a half off and just made YouTube videos pretty much every day. Um, when I did that, I did do brand deals with like Telus and Chevrolet, and that really taught me so many lessons of how I enjoyed being being worked with as a creator, so then I started my own company. So I essentially am like a consultant directly to brands. And um, now I've been able to work directly with RBC, with Best Buy, Loblaws. It's been an amazing year, and so I hope I can share some insights with you. Sure, um, this isn't about a brand deal, but it's more about um, yeah, the industries I've been working with. So, um, like I said, I'm a writer, um, and earlier this year I released my was it this year or last year? I don't even know. Um, I released my first EP. Though the world will try, oh. I have another one out now, but this first EP kind of like, um, I felt very irrelevant because it kind of exploded and everyone was really excited about it because I've been making content online for a while. Um, so it kind of got the attention of a lot of record labels because they're like, who is this? person from YouTube who makes music. Um, so I got a lot of requests to meet me to talk about record labels. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, but I also was doing a lot of writing, um, 
like, in like little captions and posts and blog posts, that kind of thing. And I knew that I've always wanted to write a book. So I was like, oh, I really want to do that. And I know that I got a lot of attention of book publishers. So in this one month, um, my manager and I had set up like a week long, or like, I don't know, like a few meetings with like different record labels and different book publishers. Um, so I did all the record label meetings first. And I walked in, and they were all men. <laughs> and they were all very loud, very handshaky and sit downy. And <laughs> they were like, We love your song. I don't know why they're American. I just feel like they should be. They're like, We love your song, uh, Tired of Losing Soulmates. My song's called Sick of Losing Soulmates. And they were like, Yeah, we love how many plays it got. That's amazing. They're not American. They were like, Wow, this is so cool. You've like blown up. Yeah, and here's what we can do for you. I was like, Okay, cool. And they were like, you know, flashing me all of these like names all on the floor. I was like, wow, so interesting. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, so that was all the record label meetings. Um, then I did all of the book publisher meetings, and I walked in, and they were all women. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the first meeting I walked into, there were bright silver balloons that spelled out my name. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and they poured me like tea and gave me cake, and they were like, we love your videos and your music. This like this like weird video from two years ago is like my absolute favorite. I was like, oh my gosh, they know me so well. And so we all just talked like really openly and it was amazing. And honestly, it wasn't about the plan. It was more like, whereas the music industry was like, what can they do for me? It was like, what can you do for us? Like, what do you want to bring? What do you want to do? What do you want, what are your goals? What do you want to work with? Um, I, so I did a bunch of them. And the last meeting I had was just these two women in a room and they sat down, and they knew my channel, they knew my music, they knew my like vision. And it was honestly more like a like a creative session. Like we talked about the themes I wanted to explore and my life stories and like it was just so fun and I felt I walked away feeling excited. I didn't feel like I was being used or like taken advantage of. I felt like we were part of a team to try and make something and I was so excited to go. Um, so, I'll give you two guesses as to what I did. Did I sign a record label? No. <laughs> no, I signed a book publisher and my book is coming out very soon. Um, but I guess my moral is um, to, yeah, do your research or work with someone because you want to and because you're excited to make something. Don't just, I don't know, we're, we're all kind of pretentious. We're like, we're good people, we make good stuff. I don't want to be used, I don't want to, you know, it's not just our numbers, it's because we're talented that we've got to where we are. That's great. It helps that they're fans. Yeah. And I think that's one thing uh, we need to keep in mind, that creators have so much more to offer besides just their reach, mm -hmm. right? We've spent time building communities of fans, uh, being authentic and engaging with them. So, uh, Sarah, do you want to talk about your experience? Of course. I think the relationship that you build with the creator is so important. I mean, just like your story, if I'm working with a brand, they bring me cake. I mean, that's amazing, and balloons, and just the little things, I think, go a far away. And so a brand that I've recently been working with is Hint, uh, Hint Water. And it's basically just naturally flavored water, no sugar, no preservatives. And I was a very heavy seltzer drinker before of another company that will not be named. Fantastic thing is, zero calories, zero sugar, zero preservatives, zero diet sweeteners, gluten-free soda, way too much sugar, water, it's boring. But I, I was doing like a lot of free promo for them for like a very long time and I was trying to get in touch with them. And so, you know, I wasn't receiving any love, which is fine. Uh, but then this company hint swooped into my Twitter DMs. And like, don't be afraid to just casually reach out and kind of build a relationship, especially people really get a kick out of talking on Twitter when brands have that presence on social media in a casual way. It's really fun and you can get some free promo out of that. But it started on Twitter and they just sent me boxes and boxes of water. You know, it probably only cost them a hundred bucks, but this was amazing. But my fridge was completely stocked of just free water, free flavored water, and that was like the best thing ever. So of course, I like unboxed it in my vlog, and um, I was just so excited to get free water. I mean, again, it was probably, it cost them a hundred dollars. And that's kind of like the first nugget. If you are a company with a product, don't wait to receive that email back from a creator. I, I get a lot of emails of like, hey, if we sent you this $20 product, would you like maybe shout it out or something? And um, I'm sure all of y'all's inboxes are just insane. And very rarely 
is that something that we're going to sit down and be like, yeah, sure, send it. So if you have like a P.O. box or a way to get something to someone, just send it and maybe write a follow-up email or something or a follow-up tweet. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in just free stuff. I mean, we're humans. I like free stuff. Free stuff. I know. What's some of the craziest free stuff you've gotten? I mean, oh my God, I have, I still have about two boxes of Chubba Chubbs. Lollies. <laughs> and I get like every friend who comes around, I'm like, please, please take it. Do you guys them. feel an obligation to, to share that stuff when you, when you yeah, receive I mean, products? It's well, nice. Yeah. So with that, it, started, it just started a relationship and I really loved the product. And so it was casually in my videos all the time. And so that started that relationship. And then, um, you know, we did a paid campaign and we did a brand deal. But it was really one of those things where it's like, hey, we want to collaborate with you. We love all the love you've been given in your vlogs. How about let's make a Facebook video? And, you know, I did a one minute f uh, Facebook video that uh, they put ad spin behind. It was really successful. And it was one of those things that didn't take me a long time, but it was really fun. It did really well on Facebook. But it was one of those things where it's like, thanks for keeping us in your videos. Here's this just like, brand deal, um, and it's, I don't know, it's turned into a really organic, authentic way that it's kind of like merged into my brand, and I think it always goes back to relationships. Um, and free stuff is fun. It can start that relationship and talk to people on Twitter. Cool. So Rachel, uh, you have a company now that links brands, agencies with creators. Can you tell me about how you decide who to work with? How should agencies know uh, who to work with and what kinds of things do we need to be aware of when setting up those relationships? I think when I first started my company, it was just, it, I never intended on ever having an agency, now having a staff. Like, it, I didn't think I'd ever go into a business world. But as a creator, I, I did these, some brand deals that were amazing. And they were cool experiences, and I loved it. And then there were times where, you know, I would work on a brand deal and maybe it would come from the brand and then it would go to a creative agency and then another agency and then somehow down this chain it would end up at me and it just I felt like it was a lot of back and forth and I just was like well when it comes to the risks of a brand I go well you know how do you know who this person is, who they're attached to, if you have to create a campaign that involves 10 people, are there politics there it's a harder job to do when you think of every creator as their own channel. And coming from broadcast, that's sort of how I look at it. So when working directly with Best Buy or RBC or these brands, it's like, well, do I know that these creators are easy to work with, that they are really positive for your brand, that they're gonna go above and beyond for you, that you're gonna be able to build that brand love? My whole job, what I focus on is if they're getting a call from me and I spend day in and day out connecting with creators, taking them to lunch, understanding what kind of people they are, where they want to go. So then when I find that perfect, I feel like it's such a matchmaker, oh my God. <laughs> when I find that perfect match, it makes the job so much easier. And when I call them, they know me because I built that relationship with them and I took them out. And then it's all based off of building that brand love and those long-term relationships with these brands. Hey. Um, so I've had a few interesting experiences. I was going to touch on best brand I ever got given first was actually hair growth pills. I'm using them now. I haven't, it's not really working yet, but like I'm very happy that I'm trying it. I feel good about myself. Like I'm going to get somewhere. I don't know. I'll update you in like a month. Um, <laughs> as far as what I would like to communicate to brands is coming up with a strategy that is a win-win for the creator. Um, I've, when I've been able to advise some strategies, I have seen say that, and also know what you're looking for. Like if you're looking for engagement or if you're looking for awareness, um, they're very, very different things. Um, when you can create a win-win for a creator, it is, the creator feels so much better about your brand, and I think you just have to look at it as it is a collaboration. You Like, this brand and this brand, do you like each other? Great. If you like each other and you're friends, they're just going to shout you out more. This is just how it works. It's just how it works with you. Normally, I work directly for the brand, but sometimes there is a uh, big creative agency in between. 
Now, I, I love these agencies. I think that they have a purpose. Um, but when it comes to coming up with an idea for a YouTuber, you have to sort of know the ins and outs, and there, it gets really complicated. So there was one deal that came to me to get a creator for, and um, we worked on it for three months, and they were supposed to be doing a cover. And about three months, everything was signed, legal was signed, three months into it, they go, okay, this is only gonna be played in Canada. Now, that's a fair thing to, they said, we just can get the licensing in Canada. And I wasn't mad, I just had to explain like, well, you know that, that if this creator is getting a million views on average and it goes out and it can only be, it's gonna be geo-blocked only to Canada, this is kind of detrimental to their career on one hand, you know, their, their fans from the UK and from the US are gonna wanna watch this video, but it's gonna say, sorry, you can't. But on a bigger scale, well, what happens is if their video goes out to less of their audience, then it tells the algorithm on YouTube that people don't like your content as much, so then they've been working so tirelessly hard, and I think that's the biggest thing I learned from being a creator, how hard it is to build an audience. And then here is this brand deal where, yes, I'm gonna give you money, but they have to, there's an internal struggle of like, do I post this? Because I know probably the next time I post a video, there's gonna be 20% less people that actually are able to see it. So I think it's just coming up with ideas that, um, that are really win-wins in the end. One thing that I've noticed, or one thing that I would want the industry to know, is to not undervalue the production time and to not overvalue the audience reach, right? At any given time, we are shooting our videos, we're writing them, we're hosting, we're editing, we're doing revisions, and we're getting paid a fraction of what it would cost to make a commercial with the production mm -hmm. company, right? So, any thoughts on that? I work with a manager. It got to the point where it was just too much, and also I am a young girl, and so I feel like when companies emailed me like a few years ago, they were you know, being faced with someone who was like, hello, I, I charge this much. Um, and now I have a manager who, you know, it gives a sort of different impression. Do you kind of have like, do you have like a set rate or does it depend on the brand? Yeah, I think, I think we have a set rate now. Okay. Uh, but obviously if I enjoy the brand and I think the idea is gonna work so well, then I will settle for whatever because I wanna make something good. Cool. Uh, my video experience, I guess, it started behind the camera. So before I did YouTube, I was making videos for companies that just lived on their social. So I didn't really under, uh, know that world of influence. And then once I became a YouTuber with an audience, you know, I was like, okay, cool. I get to make dope stuff for companies that are gonna live on my channel. And so with that, I think with every company I collaborate, there's a different set of deliverables um, because not only am I you know, posting to my channel, but I think you, know, you had a good point and don't undervalue the production value. So I take pride on making videos that look awesome, there's a good story. And so beyond my reach on YouTube, it's also a good piece of content that I can put on my Facebook page that maybe it doesn't have, honestly, barely any follows. But the moment that company puts ad spend behind it, um, people are saying, oh, this isn't a scary company logo. Like This video isn't coming from a company, but a real human. And there's personality, and there's good production value, and it's personal. And so the moment you use that as like an ad from a personal account, it's more, I think it's more engaging and, you know, it means a lot if there's that production value well, to I it. I think that's almost like a necessity now mm -hmm. to stand out with all the different algorithms that determine what people see. It's that brands need to support the content once it's created too, so either ad spend or them sharing it from their accounts. Do you have any aversion to that? Are you okay with the fact that they might boost your posts? In my experience, I mean, it's been great. I did a campaign with Visa where I went to Thailand and I did a lot of content for them. And they pushed Instagrams and pushed the video on Facebook. I mean, the Facebook video had like two million views and the Instagrams got fantastic engagement beyond what I would normally get. Uh, so I think that's a good example of like a win-win situation when it makes sense with the creator and it's not super outlandish. It works for both parties. Right. So important for agencies and brands to maybe in, in their strategy consider allotting some budget toward mm -hmm. promoting the stuff as well. Yeah, and I think that we, I mean, we look at, we, we're in Canada and there's only so many creators and I think 
you're gonna get a lot out of a creator, even some of the mid-level ones who really focus on production, and you're gonna get a great content piece, and paid is, it's a great part of your strategy. Um, if you are coming from a brand, you know, you'll probably save on some of the production. You're gonna get somebody who's very good. I, I kind of also talk about um, the sort of OGs of YouTube because they've had tons of experience. They know how to do brand deals. They know how to be professional. They've gone through it all. Um, they understand delivery times. So, and you also wanna reach a Canadian audience. So a lot of Canadian creators, you know, I find so many brands go, can you get us Canadian creators? Yes, but there's only so many. And you're saying that you want only the top ones. Well, those are only so many. And they're promoting, like, you know, if they're promoting RBC one, one month, are they going to want to promote Scotiabank the next month? Like, there's only so many creators to go around. So that's why also looking at the mid-level or the OGs, really look at the content that you want, because I think paid is a really good option. Let's open it up to questions. Are there any questions from the industry agency folks in the audience? We have some great creators here. There's a question in the front. I was in a nine to five job for five years and then went, and some people know the story, went through a layoff and breakup the same week and was like, I'm not doing anything for a little while. <laughs> and I basically just took like a year off. I saved my pennies. I took a year off and learned every single thing. I was like, how do you make a vlog? How do you, uh, like, if we, I want to do a cover of a song, how do I do a challenge video or a short film? Like, and you learned all about like frame rates and stuff like that, which I think has helped me now with running this company. But to do it, it, it I think looking, my, my thought is, honestly, is that find a job that you really don't, like you just do, and then focus your 100% of your attention on, on <laughs> what you actually want in life. It's what I've done my whole life. When I was eight, like 18, 19, I moved to Toronto, I got a job in a restaurant holding doors open for people, and I created my first company with Chris Smith Management, and it was best, it's called Best Fan. Like, it was like a blog, and I got to interview everybody, and I did what I wanted, and that helped me get to the next step. So, I think the thing is, it will come. If you follow your truth, it will come. Somehow, like, I don't know lawyers, now I have one. I'm like, okay. So, it will happen, you just have to ask the right questions and whatever you want, build that network, go to these sort of things, connect with people, and if you're a good person, you will attract good people in your life. For me, um, I, I think it's easy to forget just how long it takes to get to where we are. So, I started making videos I guess, I mean, technically, I guess in my like teens, because I carry around a camera with me and just film everything. And then I'd edit for fun. And then I started making videos. And then I won a competition from other YouTubers that sent like audience over. And I've just been making and making and making. And at first, you're terrible and you'll make mistakes. And then you learn from them and you grow from them. And it's, I, I think it's really easy to look at the end product and go, wow, there, you learned and you did it. But you learn through doing it wrong. So, yeah, it's taken a long time. And I think what you said, because technology has advanced so much, everyone's doing it. So, in a way, yes, it is easier to do it, but at the same time, it is so much harder to cut through the clutter. And this is going to sound so cheesy, but if you're not doing something that you're just completely obsessed with and that you're, you know, you don't want to stay up till 2 a.m. working on it, like it's not gonna work. Uh, making videos on YouTube was always my passion project outside, whether it was high school, college, um, just making stupid corporate videos that were just boring interview things. It was always my side project, and I just, I loved it so much that it, just no matter what it took, I was like, I'm gonna get here. And just like you said, people always see the final product, but they don't see that, that work, you just gotta be completely obsessed with it. You know? Passion is important. I think authenticity is important for longevity. When I look at you guys, like I, you know, even though we don't hang out all the time, I feel like I know you. And I think um, with YouTube, you have to be very authentic. Instagram, there's a little bit more fantasy there. <laughs> there's a little more awareness of like, okay, this is edited, this is mediated. But YouTube is like... You know the creators. Yeah, like, you know the creators. Yeah. So I would say also, you know, we're obsessed with building audiences, but that's not the only way to find success in what we do. Mm -hmm. And for me especially, I think 
Um, I wanted to find more opportunities to host and find more opportunities to travel. So yeah, you kind of have to have an idea of like, what do you want out of this and how can I get to that point? I will say also, YouTube is a great place for learning things. So I learned just, a lot by just yeah, watching just tutorials. YouTube, right? <laughs> I think you have to put in that work before to make sure that communication is solid. I mean, I think with some of the bigger brand deals, it's literally a month of just back and forth and figuring out the details. And I would say it's more on the brand side to make sure they communicate every single thing they want. You know, yeah. you, you send in drafts. It's not like, hey, the video's done, it's already on YouTube. Good luck, hope you like it. Um, but just making sure they know when to send revisions. And so um, I've personally never had that happen, but that, that just sounds like something that shouldn't happen. Yeah. And okay. if you don't like it on the brand side, then it's like, just get it right the next time. <laughs> we talk a lot, we, I mean, we talked about brands doing their homework. It's important for creators to do their homework. Mm -hmm. And I think respecting the processes that corporations work with, they do need to see a storyboard or a script. They need to have time to revise and all that stuff. So I've never had that situation either. I think because we, I don't want to go through that. So up front, we make sure this is the treatment. This is what it's going to look like. This is what the social posts are going to be. This is how many you're going to get. So yeah, I mean, I would say it's so important to make those things clear up front. How many revisions are you going to do? Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So you get X amount of revisions and I need consolidated feedback because from the brand side, maybe I'm the only creator you're working with, but from the creator side, you might be one of several projects I have going on, so I'm not your full-time editor, mm. unless you want to pay that. But. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had to get to a certain level to deem myself important enough to have a manager, um, but once that happened, my world changed. <laughs> and so from the creator's point of view, for me, it's just talking to my manager. Um, I don't, unless it's more like on the ground, I'm covering an event or something, that's when I have personal connections. Um, like with Visa and Hint, I love the people who I've gotten to work with because I'm like going to events with them. But when it's just kind of like, hey, I need this, and here are the bullet points, I get that straight from my manager. I think there's very rarely um, a time where I n even know what's on the other end. Um, I, yeah. I think it really depends. Um, obviously, I think it's good maybe to have like one buffer like in the middle. Um, but oh gosh, I've been in nightmare scenarios where it's been like manager, really agency, like many, company, yeah. brand. And it's like, yeah, you're like trying to get a deadline done and it has to go through all of these time zones and all of these people. And it just like gets so annoying because you just want to call them up and be like, is this OK? Yeah. So, yeah. And I've, I've had that situation, too, where there's a brand and an agency and another agency. And I just feel like sometimes maybe people think that they only get paid if they give an opinion. So then you end up with like 10 differing opinions because everyone had to say something. So I would say, Ooh, okay, man, uh, it's, it's been good working with agencies if the agencies get it and yeah, if they can be a buffer. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends, I guess, on the situation, but I don't mind having someone in between. One, maybe we should wrap it up unless someone can talk really oh. fast. Okay, well, let's wrap it up. Oh. So, any uh, last words of advice for the agency industry side out there? Just be understanding. Don't underestimate or undermine us. We all, we all know what we're doing. Trust us because this is how we got here. Oh, that's good. Ditto. That, what she <laughs> said. Thank you. Okay, so that is a wrap. I'm feeling less nervous. I actually had a headache before I did that. I think I had so much adrenaline pumped through my body that it is miraculously gone. Um, but yeah, that was a really fun panel. I felt like it was so refreshing to be on a panel with creators versus sometimes I have to go with just businessy people. But that was like, I felt like everyone really spoke from the heart. Um, I hope that you got something out of that. I felt like as a comprehensive panel that if I were watching and I was wanting to get some tidbits, um, that that was really effective. Oh, hey, good Great. job She's talking. Lovely. <laughs> Anyways, guys, um, I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know in the comments below one thing that you learned, because I am curious about that. Um, and I hope that you're getting something out of it. And if you like this video, definitely give it a thumbs up so I know that you like this content and that I should film some more of this influencer marketing stuff. Um, Anyways guys, if you have any questions, let me know. But like I always say, work hard, be kind to one another, spread happy vibes. I will see you very soon with a brand new video. Bye.